So I gave it various titles. I submitted, in fact, during the course of the preparation, I submitted various titles. But uh, between, behind the title is always the same material, so don't worry if you see now another title before you, then you expect it. I have only one topic to talk about, and the one possibility to call it is also written here. Now, uh, from spin waves to antiferromagnetic coupling and giant magnetoresistance. And uh, here are some remarks about the history. So, previous work on layered magnetic structures before 1986, mainly on single films, permalloy, for example, we will start with single magnetic films and then go to layered structures consisting of more than one magnetic film. And these films, these materials interact, that is, that what generates the new physics, the interaction between single films and layered structures, be it dipolar coupling, dipole-dipole mag magnetic coupling, or also interlayer exchange, which is the real exchange interaction called also after Rudermann Kitar, Kazia Yosida. Okay, so that then rehearses a little bit what I did before I came to here on a, as a postdoctoral fellow, namely I studied in Darmstadt in Germany for my PhD thesis and uh, all the time I was studying 1969 uh, optical spectroscopy in rare earth garnets. And uh, then I continued to, on that topic, 1969 to 72, as opposed to in Ottawa, Canada. But at that time, of course, we did a lot more things than just uh, crystal field analysis and research on garnets, uh, but I will talk about that a little later. Okay, so I would like to start with an advice to younger students. Uh, and uh, I can say I, at least in the beginning, obeyed very much to my, to this my advice or law. And uh, it says, so uh, yeah, it's, you see it up there. It's advice of Peter, by Peter Grunberg to young researchers. Sometimes it is necessary to change the research topic, of course. Uh, I think I still have to get familiar with that. Yeah, here, yeah. well, again. In the early 1970s and still 1969, a bit earlier, one of the interesting or re uh, popular research topics was crystal fields in rare earth garnets. And uh, behind that was that these materials were considered for lasers and also in the case of ferromagnetic garnets doped with iron for microwave components. So there was an interest in these materials. And one kind of research which was done is somehow illustrated here. Namely, crystal field analysis of uh, rare earth ions doped in, into such crystals. Then they are held the position, the site, as is shown here, and experience crystal fields from all the, uh, the ions and the charges which are around there. And one of the topics uh, on the research was the investigation of crystal field, crystal fields acting on the rare earth ions in these garnets. Now I did that in Darmstadt uh, because my supervisor gave me that project to, to work on. But after some time I noticed that I was not alone in this world to do this. And, but there was another group. Uh, I should mention before I go on that I did these investigations by measuring 
energy levels uh, by optical spectroscopy, energy levels from transitions on these ions and evaluated that and then uh, put the theory on the computer and evaluated parameters representing the crystal fields of these materials. But uh, then after some time I noticed that fortunately I was not the only one who did that. There was another group and that is written here, crystal fields in the rare earth scan is investigated by J. A. Koningstein by means of electronic Raman effect. Noel Koningstein had discovered that one can observe these energy levels which I, I investigated by means of optic spectroscopy. One can also investigate it and measure by electronic Raman effect. So then uh, I became very much interested in that and since my my work uh, in Darmstadt was close to be finished. I decided that I write him a letter and ask whether I could continue my studies of the crystal fields in these rare earths uh, in his laboratory. The answer was positive. In this way, then I came to here and continued with these investigations of the crystal fields. But of course, Noel was very pushy, doing di different things, and I was happy to follow him, and so we also looked into phonons and many other work, and I, for the first time, did research, I can say, on a somewhat larger basis intellectually, before I was always stuck to the crystal field analysis. Okay, now, now we make a jump. I probably will have to come back later to, to some other things, but uh, let's make now a jump. Uh, when I finished uh, my time here in Ottawa as a postdoc with Noel Koningstein, I got a position in uh, Jülich in Germany as a researcher, and I switched now to another experimental method and that was instead of the electronic Raman effect, which we did here, I switched to brilliant light scattering. And an apparatus of that kind is shown here. It's shown here. Like in Raman spectroscopy, we use, uh, we use lasers for to excite these uh, spectra. But uh, in the case of brilliant light scattering, it's a scattering event similar to Raman scattering. And I will come back to the differences, which are important in a minute. But then we investigate uh, from a spot-like spot on the sample, but otherwise we measure the inelastic light scattering and, uh, with, with a laser and uh, investigate the, the light by means of that fabry perot interferometer. So we are talking at the moment about brilliant spectroscopy and we're talking about Raman spectroscopy and compare them. And it turns out that uh, they are very similar except that the frequency range away from the exciting line is rather different, which is available by the two methods. This is a typical Raman spectrum and the exciting line, zero laser line, would be somewhere here, but the uh, lines which you can observe uh, by this method are situated typically right here with a frequency shift. So for example here, this, this one. So what you see is uh, this, uh, uh, this line at 21 specifically centimeter displaced from the elastic scattering, and this is a typical value for Raman spectroscopy. For the phenomena you want to measure by Brillouin spectroscopy by that Fabry Perot interferometer, you have typically smaller frequency shifts, 
which you could not be able to resolve with this method. Frequencies would be on the order of uh, reciprocal centimeter or 30 gigahertz. Here we have 20 reciprocal centimeter. So the range which you can cover with brilliant spectroscopy is much more closer to the exciting line as in Raman spectroscopy. This is one of the features. Uh, this is why I decided when I came back then to Darmstadt that I built up equipment for brilliant spectroscopy and at Raman I did some for more Raman work together with Stuttgart uh, institutes, Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart. Uh, but in Jülich I built up the brilliant spectroscopy. So this gives you, this is a general uh, picture showing spin waves. So, so for the understanding what is the spin waves, we have to consider that we have static magnetism. Up to now I can't get any light out of that. Okay, this illustrates a spin wave. And uh, what you see is a processing magne magnetic moment where from one side in your crystal to the next you have a phase difference and that all together establishes then a propagating spin wave. Next please. Okay, and this was then our first experiment using Berlin spectroscopy in Darmstadt now. Sorry, in Jülich. In Jülich, after I came back from here from Ottawa to Jülich, and we uh, had built up this uh, kind of equipment and investigated my first samples, which were europium oxide, as was also mentioned in the introduction. Okay, one very interesting, fascinating phenomenon we saw in that normally you have Stokes and anti Stokes scattering in, in the light scattering, so you see both with frequency upshift and frequency downshift. Uh, lines which correspond to Stokes and anti-Stokes scattering and that uh, essentially should was also the case here except that uh, in the upper spectrum on the left hand side you see a peak designated one M1AS you see that on the other side you see a peak M1 uh, a, uh, no, on one side you see M1AS, yeah, that's what I said, and on the other side you see MS. These are Stokes anti-Stokes scattering from the same phenomenon from, uh, from a spin wave. But then you see also in the upper spectrum a peak designated M2S, and this doesn't have uh, a counterpart on the anti-Stokes side. As you see, there is nothing, simply not there. And for a long time, uh, we were wondering about this phenomenon, and we thought it's maybe higher harmonic, uh, combination tones, or whatever you, what could maybe be possible. But nothing really fitted very well. We were not very happy with all these interpretations. And then, fortunately, our I say fortunately, our whole system broke down, the cryostat broke, we had to take everything down, make repairs, and when we started the experiment again after the repairs, suddenly this additional peak M2S was on the other side. and we didn't know what's going on. Then it took me a sleepless night and on the other morning I drove with my bike to the laboratory and on the fence of our laboratory I had an idea. <laughs> and the idea was what we had observed was a surface mode of that material which travels only in one direction along the surface. This is also indicated, I think, by arrows. Yeah, maybe. Oh, you see in the other picture, 
you see the, symbolically the, the magnetic plate, the magnetic sample, and you see this uh, propagation of a spin wave symbolically around the sample. And that would be, that is related to the direction of the magnetic field which is up. When you do the same experiment with uh, the magnetic field pointing down, then the sense of the rotation of, of this mode of the spin wave reverses, and then you have on the front side the opposite uh, propagation direction than in the upper case. So you can reverse the propagation direction of that mode simply by rotating the magnetic field by going to the opposite sign of the magnetic field. And that can all be explained uh, on basic of symmetry, on the basic of the symmetry, because uh, you have to consider the uh, magnetization as an axial vector which determines also a sense of rotation, which includes the sense of rotation. And what we see is only that the phenomenon spin wave in that case obeys, so to say, the underlying symmetry uh, of our system. This is the inherent symmetry of our system, and the spin wave obeys it because we have magnetism and we have this reversal of the sense of rotation around this sample. Now, uh, this uh, later on we became aware that this phenomenon we were not the discoverer of this phenomenon, somebody else had discovered before, theoretically. Uh, this was only the first light scattering experiment, where this phenomenon shows up uh, very neatly, uh, in a very elegant way. You have this reversal of the sense of rotation and Stokes anti-Stokes reversal. But somebody else, uh, Damon Eschbach, uh, Mr. Eschbach, who worked together with uh, Mr. Damon somewhere in the United States, had discovered that theoretically, and uh, well, we, we had the first light scanning experiment. But uh, I was very happy that recently I got a letter from, the, from Mr. Eschbach's son, because his father will be 90 soon in October, and they uh, wrote to me and asked me that I should write a little article uh, about the so-called Damon Eschbach mode, which shows this behavior, so they can present it to their father at the occasion of his 90th birthday. I said I am very happy to do that, but it reminds me something else, which is, uh, happens sometimes in physics. You know that, uh, what was the great British uh, physicist, uh, the, the man with, uh, with the apple on the head, who can tell? Newton. 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 Newton, <laughs> Newton uh, discovered, uh, established the laws of mechanism, of, uh, of mechanics in a way. The first, uh, or, uh, the first basic sentence in, in mechanic properties uh, came by Beer, uh, and once they, they praised him and asked him how he find that, and then he answered, well, I was standing on the shoulders of giants, by that he meant Galilee, and therefore I could see further. So then I could, I'm a, a little bit in a very, in a similar position now that I have the Damon Eschbach mode and uh, I can recognize the Damon Eschbach mode because I know the work of uh, Damon Eschbach and so uh, in a way I'm also standing on the, on the shoulder of a giant, namely, namely Damon Eschbach, to, to find that out. Okay. So let's go on. So that was uh, the first experiments in Jülich which we did on these phenomena. And uh, meanwhile, the uh, equipment, the brilliant light scattering apparatus, had been developed even more. Uh, that had become now an instrument 
where you have uh, three paths operation that is indicated here. You see three paths. In addition, a tandem interferometer operation where you have even two such interferometers switched behind each other and each three pass goes three times also through the other interferometer. So I do not want to go into the details, but it was a very exciting and uh, uh, great uh, achievement in, in the light scattering community and in these experiments. And we made use of it further then. So next, please. Okay, now uh, I would like to show you some development in the observe, observation of light scattering from spin waves. This is uh, a, bark, uh, a bark sample of iron. In fact, this is a the the theoretical spectrum, but the ones which are observed are very similar. There's not very much difference, although this is theory here, which we see at the moment. And what we see is the large peak on the right hand side is again now on the surface mode that corresponds to that so-called daemon eschbach mode. And the other peaks are uh, exchange split bulk modes. When you make such samples uh, thicker and thicker, you observe the stru fine structure uh, of these different peaks. And the on the left and on the right hand side, so then you you lose the resolution, but when you make the films again thinner, they come out sharper and sharper, and you can see them individually, like designed by a one, A1, A2, and so on. Uh, you have these different standing waves and observed by light scattering. Here it's a, a, a theoretical prediction. Okay, next please. Now, uh, we did then decided that we would like to explore these phenomena. Now, now there are, of course, many different pos possibilities to go on with the research. Uh, we decided that we now try to go to thin magnetic films and see how the splitting of these uh, standing spin wave modes uh, proceeds, uh, what we can learn from that. And here is now a typical example from light scattering from a film which has uh, a thickness of, two, two, I think, 200 angstroms. We we'll have to look nearer. What is it? I think it's a 200 angstrom. I cannot see it very well from here. So a uh, magnetic film of 200 angstroms provides this spectrum as we can see here. These are standing modes, in particular the green ones. And uh, the red ones are again our daemon Eschbach mode, but now since the film gets thinner and thinner, we see it also now on the back side of the film, on the other side of the film, on both sides now. And you see the red peaks, both Stokes and anti-Stokes, uh, only the green peak, and, and the, as well as the green peak. Next, please. So then after we found that now the, these modes and single films have sufficiently been explored and we understand them to a reasonable uh, uh, amount, we can understand what's going on. And we decided now we would like to go over to other phenomena where we start to couple these, these modes on the different films and that, that means we go to double layers or layered structures where we have more than one film in our package of films that is indicated there. In, in particular in the lower part you see such a magnetic double layer. And you see the different uh, spin waves which you propagate in, in that. And in particular what is of interest is the coupling. For the coupling we developed then the following recipe, how to understand that. That is shown in the, on the right hand side. Let's start on the right hand side with the bars which shown in red. Can we show? Okay, yes, right. And uh, suppose you have now 
such modes which are uniform, which are approximately daemon eschbach modes for in the thick film limit, they can be realized by this. But we consider for simplicity now modes which are uniform. We neglect this small decay of the amplitude of the daemon eschbach mode across the thickness of the film, assume they are uniform, and construct now from these uniform modes the so-called double layer modes in, in zeros order approximation. And that, that works in such a way as is shown. We can always, when we start with the, yeah, with exactly with this one, we can combine two uniform modes in a symmetric way, as is there shown there, but also in an anti-symmetric way, as is shown there. And um, once we do that, we can now turn on the, really, the interaction that uh, we can do that with, so to say, without considering the strength of the interaction, then we have the upper part of the picture. But when we now really turn on the interaction between the films, which could also be the exchange interaction, then we get the splitting and we get the development of other modes which are typical for the double layer system and that is then the uniform mode again because we always also have a uniform mode that is this one and from the other combination the anti-symmetric combination we get the first standing mode so then for, for the combined film we have uh, when we really have combined the film we have again only one film then uh, that must then also be the uh, spin wave mode spectrum of a, com of a single film when we have combined them to one. And that is what we see. We construct the uniform mode, first standing mode, and for the higher modes then we construct also the second standing mode. So the whole scale of spin waves we can then uh, gain again after that combination and after the full interaction. So that gave us uh, some courage now to go on and do also experiments because we thought we have now found a method how to investigate the interaction of different spin waves in these double layer structures and what we can uh, learn from that. Next please. Yes, uh, this is, this shows only some analogs where similar phenomena occur where we have from, from single oscillations we get uh, combined oscillations that is also for example in the uh, acoustics for a tuning fork you can have a tuning fork where you have the symmetric oscillation which is now something like this. if you look at me the symmetric oscillation of the tuning fork would be like this but the asymmetric would be like this. And that you can also do with the higher order modes. In a similar way, you can also discuss uh, coupled pendulum with a spring in between. Then you have this mode for, 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 for this system, but you can also have this mode. And now it turns even out that if you consider the anti-symmetric mode, where, where they both go like this, there should be no additional interaction. It should be uh, should be straight on on uh, on a horizontal line uh, because uh, there is no uh, no additional energy for the oscillation when they uh, when they oscillate like this. So then we understand that one in one case. The, the, when we do the interaction, when we combine to to two layer system, there is no change in the energy. Only in the other case, there is an upshift of the energy in, into the second mode of the combined film. Okay, so that this serves only for then when you do these things, you want to convince yourself that you are doing it in the right way and in similar the various sim, uh, limiting cases, you get the correct result and understand it, the whole phenomenon altogether. Okay, next please. So now I would like to cut it a little bit shorter. 
maybe tell only indicate how the, how that proceeded. So now we thought, or we were convinced, we have now a tool to investigate layered structures and in particular the interaction between single layers across an interlayer by looking at these different modes. Qualitatively the understanding was there, quantitatively we had corporations with theory groups who could calculate that on that basis, introduce an interlayer exchange parameter and calculate that numerically and then that we can compare with, with the experiment and that's what we did. And in uh, as a result of this, we finally found uh, really uh, interlay a change coupling, which also switched the magnetization around by 180 degrees from one film to the next, and uh, uh, could be represented by antiferromagnetic interlay exchange coupling. Okay, let me just go on. Next, please. Okay, so then came the day where we plotted all these results together. The frequency of these of these double ohm, double layer modes as a function of the interlayer thickness, which is shown here. That was really collecting all the data which we had at that time and putting it into one plot. And you see the first maximum when you increase the interlayer thickness, you see at small values uh, uh, a dip. Yeah, when you go down there, a strong minimum. And this strong minimum indicates an interaction between the two films, which leads, in fact, to antiferromagnetic coupling which has a component which wants to order the two films in our structure anti-parallel. This uh, is important to realize that the actual order there in that point is not an anti-parallel alignment. We have an external field where we always align the films magnetically parallel to each other. But the interaction at that point uh, for that interlayer thickness contains also this antiferromagnetic uh, component and wants to align them antiferromagnetically. But we always hold the, the structure in the ferromagnetic alignment, only the interaction and the, the frequency of the spin waves and this deep dip shows that there is a strong antiferromagnetic coupling superimposed. But the static alignment is always parallel. Okay, nevertheless, that was the discovery of uh, antiferromagnetic interlay exchange. And, uh, well, uh, was an achievement in itself. But soon we asked ourselves, now what can we do with it? We have now samples where we have uh, the two uh, iron films, for example, an interlayer in between, and if we don't apply, apply a magnetic field, they order anti-parallel to each other, these iron films. A nice phenomenon, but of course now one asks itself, what can we do with it? And soon came, of course, the idea, we have to look for resistivity measurements, we have to do for, for transport measurements. Uh, maybe the order makes a difference uh, in the electric resistivity when we have the, the films oriented by an you know, external magnetic field so that two films are parallel to each other. Then we decrease the external field and let the antiferromagnetic interaction win. Then they would uh, line anti-parallel. And then uh, the question is whether we could observe that with electric resistivity. Okay, so that was the next experiment. Can we have a slide? Oh yeah, th this is only a remark which we were with the uh, discovery of antiferromagnetic interlayer coupling. We were not the only one. There was another group, uh, two other groups, in fact 
working with neutron scattering, and they had also in their structures observed by neutron scattering this antiferromagnetic interlayer exchange. Ours was uh, the only 3D transition metal system with iron and chrome. And okay, this uh, should be mentioned at that point. And now we are coming um, to the experiment where we know from the light scattering experiment and from the spin waves that our samples have antiferromagnetic interaction, that there is a component in the interaction we want to have have the samples uh, magnetically anti-parallel, but with an external field we can overcome that and force the parallel alignment. And now that is shown here what happens then to the, uh, to the uh, electric resistivity. I have to see, yeah. In the upper two panels we see measurements of the Moog signal, which is in a way a magnetization measurement to Moog, and very often we use magneto-optic care effect to measure directly the static behavior or the static magnetization. And that is on the left-hand side in the upper panel. We see, for example, when we go to uh, large negative values of the external field, the uh, films are aligned parallel to each other. Then when we go to more to zero, to the right-hand side, then one, then they, uh, the antiferromagnetic coupling interaction wins and puts them in the in opposite alignment. When we go on further, then we can again parallel alignment, but with the opposite direction as, uh, as previously, as when we started. And uh, so that shows the alignment of the films. And we have in that range, which is indicated by this anti-parallel order, in the middle, we see that circle where the anti-parallel order is indicated. We can see that the electric resistivity of the sample is increased. And the same happens also when we do go now to the right-hand side. This is a sample where the magnetic order is indicated in the upper panel. They also have uh, on both sides uh, of, of that diagram, we have parallel alignment, and then the total resistivity is small, but in the middle we have anti-parallel alignment, and the resistivity is large, and that is shown in the panel which is below that. Uh, we see the behavior of the resistivity, that it is uh, largest when we have the anti-parallel alignment. So that was the current discovery of, uh, of the giant magnetoresistance effect, where the resistivity of such structures changes with the relative orientation of the magnetization and can be large or low. It's lar uh, large when they are anti-parallel and low when they are parallel. Now, uh, at this point, I should, of course, also mention that there was another group, Albert Fert, in, in France, who did similar experiment and came to the same conclusion, no, only that he did all these experiments uh, on multi-layers and therefore had also larger effects. But uh, we concentrated more on the different cases to really show that this has to do with the relative alignment of the magnetization. That's why we choose these different configurations in our samples to really have to prove that this is connected with the relative orientation of the magnetization. We get all these uh, resistivity, uh, resistivity phenomena. Okay, please, next. Yeah, this is essentially the same again. On the right hand, uh, left hand side, we see the magnetic switch, uh, magnetization of, of one film switching. This is uh, only an animation, 
but uh, the, yeah, it doesn't show what should happen now on the other side because the resistivity now should jump from, from a high to a low value while we have that. Sorry, maybe I should have taken that out. Okay, next please. Okay, now another very interesting phenomenon and uh, observation is shown here by the, maybe I sh we look first at, at the top of the drawing, which is shown the giant magnetoresistance effect. So what is shown here is on the left hand side we have parallel alignment uh, in a cross section of, of two magnetic theorems. And the resistivity is, is thought to be low because uh, in, in this current loop, the magnetic theorems are par mag magnetically parallel and the uh, resistivity is thought to be small. When we uh, align them anti-parallel, as in the second, yeah, right there, then the resistivity increases. So, so we can measure from the resistivity of the arrangement whether the two films are parallel or anti-parallel aligned. So, so far, so nice. But now, the next challenge is how could we could we possibly uh, change this current in such a way or make the current so strong that this alignment is uh, uh, obtained by the flowing current? And that is the case that has been uh, predicted by John Stolzewski and Berger in a calculation that this should be possible that we have such strong currents that the magnetic firms, so to say, order according to the strength of the current. And it is made plausible in, in the lower part uh, of this uh, illustration, where we have on the right hand, no, on the left hand side, uh, uh, the arrow uh, indicates the magnetization. And in order to, to have a cleaner discussion, we assume that it is slightly tilted. Otherwise, when you have everything parallel, sometimes you cannot recognize it more what the reason is. But we assume that the magnetization there is slightly inclined. And now we, have, uh, now we drive a current, which is uh, shown by this green arrow on top of that drawing. We drive a current. This means that we Transfer a lot, uh, transmit a lot of electrons from that inclined state on the left hand side to the other film. And the other film reacts to that, gets a torque by these incoming electrons with which their inclination, until finally it uh, aligns also parallel to, to the left hand side. This is in a way easy to believe because we simply transmit an abundance of, of electrons with another angle into the other film. So it's not surprising that we get finally the new magnetization determined by, by these incoming electrons. But it is also possible to have the opposite direction uh, that is shown on the right hand side. Now we have the current flowing from the thin film to the thick film on the other side. And uh, the point is now, I have to mention first that in all these experiments we hold the thicker film, so to say, constant in its direction because we give it a large coercivity, so they force it always to stay in the same direction. Otherwise, we would not, from the symmetry, be able to, to have all these changes. So now, again, this remains tilted, as you see, this, uh, this magnetization in the thicker film. But we continue to transmit electrons from the 
right hand side to the left hand side from the thinnerferm to the thicker firm. And what happens if we shift that a little bit up in this picture, we cannot see the lower end. Or do we? Well, anyway, um, yeah, I think we see uh, enough. Now the electrons are reflected back from the thinner film because they cannot penetrate. They are simply reflected back and so to say the thinner film loses this magnetization and due to the electrons which are reflected finally rotates also its magnetization because the other, the thicker film, stays always the same. So the reflected electrons on the thicker side now come back to the thinner film and rotate there the magnetization in such a way that it is finally opposite. So depending on whether they have the current flowing in one direction, which is the green, and on the opposite direction, which is the red case, we get a switching of the thinner film of the two into the parallel or into the anti-parallel orientation. Now this is of course exactly what, one, what people are dreaming of when they want to do magnetic recording. On the, maybe we go to the next slide. Yeah, no, this is already a bit too advanced for the moment. I don't know if I, let, let's go back to the previous, that should be sufficient, yeah. So now one can make an, an device where you can switch the magnetization in the parallel or anti-parallel orientation between the two K, between the, between the two films by having the current flowing parallel uh, in one or in the other direction through this two-layer structure. And this is exactly what we want to do when we do magnetic recording. On the other hand, we can use the giant the magnetic resistance effect as I indicated with the picture which we saw on top on the left-hand side. We can measure the status of, of the, or the situation, whether they are parallel or anti-parallel, we can measure uh, from the size of the G giant magnetic resistance effect. So that is everything what we need for magnetic recording. We can write the information, but we can also read it out. Okay, so... Yeah, let, let's go on now, yeah. Now this is in more detail how, how various influences can be used here in order to get the proper alignment. This is the landau lifshitz equation, which is written on the top, of, on the left, uh, on the right hand side, with uh, various contributions. The first contribution is the effect of the external magnetic field, which is in blue that makes the, essentially the magnetization only precess. The second contribution is a damping term with the alpha, which takes care of the damping that uh, due to the damping, the amplitude of the precession decreases. And finally, uh, that is the new term, is the spin torque term represented by the by the last uh, contribution to that equation uh, is uh, the excitation of the precession due to the incoming electrons, to the transmitted electrons, which let the precession going or even let the precession increase until we have the switching of the amplitude uh, of, of the precession. Uh, to the new status of anti-parallel or, uh, par uh, or parallel. Next, please. This shows various cases where you can simply use different parameters. The physical situation is of some indicated uh, on the right-hand side. 
uh, where we see the magnetization of the film which switches, which is the thin film of, of uh, in the case which we considered before, the, the, the thinner film, the other one, as I said, uh, stays always constant because uh, the large anisotropy, so we make it stay always constant. Only the thin film switches, and here is the thin film shown again, and its magnetization sh lies in the plane of the film, but can make a precession due to the incoming electrons, and there are different trajectories shown what can happen when you dif do use uh, different strengths of the incoming p spin polarized current or of the other parameter in our calculation. So that is pretty well now under control in the, in the calculation. But of course, uh, if that really describes the experimental situation is not, not so clear. But anyway, it's an interesting topic for investigation, what and called also spin dog switching and has this application of, ma of uh, magnetic writing information. Okay, I wonder if you still have other slides. No, not, not that important at the moment. Maybe just go on. Yeah. Okay, show, please show the next one. Otherwise, yeah, I think this is also good. So, the, this is what I was just uh, saying can now be applied. Oh, industry is working uh, very strongly on such an application as is shown here. You can use uh, the, to address these cells which you see in green, red and green are these cells by in which you can store the energy in the form of parallel or anti-parallel alignment of the green layers. Uh, but and due to the phenomena which I described, you can switch to a parallel or anti-parallel orientation of these units, the green, red units and this we write uh, one or a bit via this uh, phenomena which I just described uh, by having the current going through these uh, blue bars entering uh, one of these units and going to the other side that would be the just the bit which is addressed uh, in, and when you have the strong current strong enough it could switch, you can write then in such a unit, but you can also read it out by let the current going through there. In reality, one has to add to this structure also still diodes. Below each of these package of green, red, green, you have to mount a diode, otherwise the current would flow through all the other nodes also and would be distributed and ca cannot switch one single unit of that. So, so that is another uh, difficulty that one has to add to each of these packages. You have to add a diode to have the current going in one direction, not the opposite. Okay, so we have a very nice uh, topic in this case for, for research. There's still many, many things to do. Of course, the whole material parameter question is behind it, uh, improve the materials. But there's also a lot of nice physics and interesting attra attractive fields to, uh, to be for fun for physicists and engineers. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>